Hello, everyone. I am really excited today. We have Katie Gardner joining us. She is in Buffalo, New York. Katie is a licensed occupational therapist, and she is here today because she is going to be sharing some of her journey with chronic illness, which includes a diagnosis for chronic fatigue syndrome, as well as some other things. I'll let her go into details of that, uh, but I'm just really excited to have you here. Uh, welcome, Katie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to meet with you and to be here. I am really excited to hear more about your story. And I'm so grateful and beyond impressed that you are willing and able to do this right now, because I hope you don't mind my sharing, but Katie is 38 weeks pregnant as we speak. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully not during this interview, but that, that would add some excitement. <laughs> it would. <laughs> Well, you're a trooper. Thanks for doing this. I hope your week goes well. You induced when on your Wednesday. You're getting induced on Wednesday. Yeah. So very exciting. Your world is about to get even crazier. I'm excited. That's the thing. Like life opened up and once we got better, you know, yeah. I, everyone must be feeling this. Like I got a second chance of life. Yes. And like, everything. I just like, I don't even know. Cause I couldn't even picture my future before. I think it was too hard to dream or hope. And now it's like, who knows what will happen. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's, if, if I'm having even the slightest bad day, I catch these moments and I have to catch myself and be like, you are a walking miracle. Like, this is incredible. You are living something that you dreamed about every day for years. Like, your life is a dream. Whatever it is that's stressing you out does not matter. It does not matter. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I, that's one of my prayers is may I never forget. May I never forget and become, no offense, but like a normal person. <laughs> yeah. Who takes it for granted? I yeah. never want to forget because that that joy is so enlivening, and it's like every day it's like you're winning the race. Every day you're like, yes, yeah. It's like, it's like being like when you watch a six year old wandering through the world, and they're just like, oh, a flower, a tree, oh, a puppy. <laughs> it's like this these new eyes where you just get to almost be childlike again and just really appreciate things so much so yeah i hope it doesn't go away yeah i don't think i don't think it will but it's something i i do think about often i yeah i i think i think i'll appreciate this it is hard though to have friends who've never been through it like most of my friends have obviously never been through it and yeah they complain about their lives and I just feel such a detachment sometimes. It is hard. As much as it probably was hard for them to be my friend through it, sometimes it's hard for me to be their friend now because I'm like, you have it all. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I really struggle with people who, uh, probably we all have our triggers, but people who seem physically able to go to the gym but just choose not to. <laughs> It was it was worse for me when I was sick. Like I would give anything to be because I love working out. So that's one of my things that I really missed. So when I could see people who could and just didn't, of course I don't know their life and I don't know what they're facing and they've got their own reasons and limitations. I have no clue what's going on in their world. But but yeah, it's I know I know exactly what you mean. I I felt that way about people who complain about work, and I'm like that's all I want to be able to do. Like I. It was my life and my identity, but yeah, you're right. You know, and people are entitled to complain about their lives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> their problems are real. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it did it does change things. So it is nice to just connect with other people who kind of had this experience. Just before we dive in, as I always say, uh, I'm not a medical professional. Katie is an occupational therapist, so she is a medical professional. But neither one of us are for sure your medical professionals at the moment. So we're just sharing our own personal experience of living with and recovering from chronic illness. So certainly nothing of what we share should be considered medical advice. My story actually begins in childhood, actually, because I did have some major infections that impacted my ability to go to school. And I was in the hospital a lot. No one knew really what was wrong. 
And the reason I bring that up is because it's relevant to later. It was constant uh, fungal infections in my stomach and intestines. And the doctor couldn't find it a lot of times, couldn't treat it. It's believed that some of that stuff may have triggered my genetic condition. And so I did recover from that. So I knew healing was possible. And it wasn't until 2014 that I actually started to experience chronic fatigue symptoms where I couldn't walk. Um, I just wasn't recovering from sleep. So I, I would be working for about every, I don't know, two to four months, and then I would end up collapsing, and I just couldn't recover fully. So anytime I did a strenuous task, I would have that sort of price to pay, so to speak. So that's when I knew something was more serious and started to investigate it and try to heal. So what happened when you initially went to the doctors? What did they say? I was initially diagnosed with fibromyalgia. They completely ignored the ability that I was having a hard time moving against gravity and fatigued. Uh, they really missed the fatigue. So it, it took a while before I even got the chronic fatigue diagnosis, but no one would even really treat it. I don't think they really knew what to do. Uh, they looked at just blood work, rheumatology, it just really, I wasn't really getting care for it for many years. Yeah, unfortunately, such a common story. I'm sure you've seen as well. It seems to be the same for so many of us in the beginning. Not a lot of answers, not a lot of help. So what did you do? Well, I kept trying to rehabilitate myself being an occupational therapist mm -hmm. and leaving the hospital because of my childhood experience. I just kept researching doctors, researching as much as I could. And then eventually I moved from New York City back home to Buffalo. And that's where I got linked with some really great doctors. First, an integrative nurse practitioner, which did a whole nother level of investigative blood work that I was not used to. I call her the blood detective. <laughs> she was looking at underlying infections. Okay. Uh, Candida, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, bacterial infections, and she went out and helped me to go after that, and for a while that actually made me worse. It was pretty brutal treatment. She would try to build my body up, but at the same time it was beating down these infections, but I could, for some reason, never, my body just couldn't fight, and that was the missing link. Why couldn't my body fight these infections? Other people have. Epstein Barr virus and they recover. What was it about my body? That was the missing link. And that's what brought me to my other doctor, who's an immunologist and right. probably, probably the most brilliant man I know. And he started looking at uh, genetic conditions that have to do with metabolic myopathies uh, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And what direction did he suggest going for that? Or what, what, yeah, where did you take it from there? So I had a full genetic or full genome testing done. And I did find that I have a mitochondrial disease called mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome 11. And when I read about it, it was like tears down my face because it's like targets the diaphragm. I was like, this is it, finally. And uh, he put me on the my cocktail, which helped my basically I my body wasn't producing mitochondria so I could never fight infections um my body didn't have the strength to fight infections so by him then supplementing and boosting my mitochondria I could now fight the infections that I was trying for I probably like a year and a half prior and it, it, when the two came together it was like that's it <laughs> wow so before you got this, what were your days like or what were your weeks like? Oh, my goodness. I, I was working on a master's degree, which, you know, is a lot. It's a lot of work. There are full days. I was doing clinical rotations. I had friends. I went out almost every night of the week. I don't even know how I did so good in school. Like, I, I love to socialize. I love to go out. I traveled. I lived in Colorado. I lived in Philadelphia. I lived in New York City. I, I'm sure everyone was shocked when I got so sick. It's just not something that anyone probably could have predicted or seen coming. It wasn't at all like my childhood experience. It's completely different. 
Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it came on pretty suddenly. It seems like that, but when I look back, I think that there were some signs that I was stressed. I had been in graduate school. I had been in a stressful relationship, a toxic relationship. I was just probably overworking myself. I was living in New York City, working very long hours. I was a traveling therapist at one point, so I was walking I was working 10 hour days, walking from one end of Manhattan to the other end of Manhattan. I think there were some warning signs. I wasn't necessarily the healthiest person. Yeah. So many things. It it just really seems like so many of us have so much of the same. You know, it seems like it comes on suddenly, but when we look back, we see we have pretty much, I mean, I'm sure it's not everybody, but I imagine you've noticed the same. Just really pushing it, not taking such good care of ourselves. But on the surface, we look so vibrant, so healthy, because we're always on the go. We might be working out a lot, you know, just very social, happy looking people. So you went from obviously being very active, you know, very engaged in life. When when you got sick, what did that look like? What did your days and your weeks look like after that? For those for that first year, however long before you started getting the help that you needed? The first year was kind of basically me living in denial. Uh, I would continue to try to work and people would pull me aside like, this is dangerous. <laughs> you need to stop. Because I was also working with patients. I was I was scared I would rob people. I was scared I was going to hurt people. I felt an ethical responsibility to step away. It just wasn't safe. I didn't feel safe riding the subway home because I thought I'd pass, I'd fall asleep or pass out and I'd my stop and wake up and not know where I was. It was very difficult to do grocery shopping. So I just kept trying. And then challenge what it felt like. It took me a while to realize that this was serious and that it needed a full-time job. So eventually you had to quit your job and focus on getting your health back. What are some other things that have contributed to your recovery? I would say lifestyle modification. I had to dramatically change my diet through, um, I had to do basically an elimination diet first to figure out what was causing, basically use food as medicine, as a mindset of healing. And then I also had to really work on rehab uh, through movement. And for me, that's really important because I can't get my cells oxygen if I'm not So I know movement is a very hot topic and it is very controversial because it can deplete us if not done properly, but I had to start somewhere and that made, it made a huge, uh, gradually increasing my ability to. And then also I removed all toxic ingredients, immunotoxic. I changed my, my water filtration system on my house. I just the lengths to which I went to remove things, and it really helped to decrease my symptoms. So you mentioned diet played a big role, and it seems that a lot of us find this. And I'm curious what diet changes ended up helping for you. Not because I think necessarily it's the key for anyone else, but I think it's good for people to see that there are different paths to health through diet for people and it is very much individual. So I'm curious for you, what ended up being your, um, what, what did your body respond to? Well, the, the three main offenders that were pretty obvious before I even did the elimination diet were dairy, gluten, and sugar. And then from there, I tried many different diets. I did find for me, I needed a high protein uh, meat-based diet. And I don't know if that's part of, because of mitochondrial disease. But when I tried vegetarian, I had a hard time with beans. I had a hard time with soy. And so I've struggled with some of those uh, components of it. So I found that some nightshades bother me. I don't know if I'm familiar with nightshades, but I did have a problem with those for a while. Nightshades, that's things like, what is that? Is that tomatoes and bell peppers or what is? Yes, it's tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, eggplants. The one I can't take, I can't tolerate anymore. I can see the funny thing of when I did the elimination diet and I gave my body a break to heal, I slowly could incorporate those things back in without being as inflamed over time. So it's kind of scary at first. You're like, well, what am I going to have left? But eggs were bothering me for a while. They don't bother me. So I just, 
took some things out for a while, gave my body that chance to heal, and then slowly would incorporate them. And sometimes they did offend me still, and sometimes they didn't. Well, that's encouraging that you didn't have to cut everything out forever, because that is a bit of a scary prognosis to look at for your life like how eating is just going to be stressful forever (laughs) it was stressful and it's very hard to do I did it as a last resort after years of suffering it wasn't my first (laughs) of trying to do that it is very hard and required a lot of support from my husband and my my mom and help because I was honestly too sick to cook for myself and and with those types of restrictions it's just hard to meal plan hard to it's it's a hard process And for me, it also required, I I think I hear you saying the same thing, but just a level of desperation because it is hard, but you get to a point where you're so desperate, you just, you need, you'll do just about anything to get your health back. So all of a sudden what felt unthinkable is suddenly doable. And another thing that helped me, because for a while I tried really hard to get my diet in order, but I would cheat and fall off and then come back to it before I really got serious. Um, You know, as time rolled on and I could see that I wasn't getting my life back, I was going to have to get more serious. But another thing, you know, sugar, we all mentioned, seem to mention sugar and sugar was a massive one for me. And sugar was a tough one for me, not just because I liked it and I didn't want to get rid of it, but because I clearly had a physical addiction. It was intense. I would get up in the middle of the night, every single night and eat sugar. Like there was something happening. I would sometimes take a spoon and eat it right out of the canister. Like it was insane. So for me, it was healing my gut, getting more probiotics. And I always thought it was a willpower thing. I was just weak and I just, why can't I stop? I know this is bad for me. But once my body started healing, the cravings went away. So I think the desperation combined, you know, with the the body starting to heal and get a bit more in balance. So those cravings go away and it all becomes a bit more doable. It does become a bit more doable. It, it's really hard at first. And I had, I have memories of being a little kid and like going in the corner and like eating treats like nonstop and like bread. I was obsessed with bread. <laughs> and I think it was feeding that infection. And there was some sort of addiction there. And I mean, it's very, it's very hard to fight, fight that. But once I got broke through you're right I didn't feel those cravings the same way and doesn't it just feel like freedom I thought I was going to have to face this the rest of my life I thought my whole life was going to be a battle with food because it really was before I got sick and it's just incredible to have this healthy relationship with food where it's not a battle and you're not trying to force yourself to eat the right things and okay so I just want to make sure I'm catching all of this so for you the main things uh, what Could you summarize for us? What what were the main things that worked for you for your recovery? The main things that worked, there's some things actually I didn't miss. I I did have to go back and heal trauma. I had to do some spiritual healing, so some mind-body work. Mm -hmm. I had to modify my diet. I had to create some sort of movement routine that worked for my body that I could tolerate and not decline with. And I had to remove all environmental toxins. Okay. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very similar to my journey as well. And I think it's good using the word movement. And this is one of the mistakes I think when I talk about my recovery journey is I call it exercise. And when people hear exercise, they picture at the gym or going for a run. But when I'm talking about my exercise program, it was so small. You know, it was one to two minutes a day. And in the beginning, not even every single day. And it was just really gentle movement because I think you're right it is definitely a sensitive topic and with good reason because full-blown exercise can you know put people in the hospital even just three or four minutes of it and it's it, wrapping your head around I gotta get this lymph moving to reduce I have to put I have to and I have to get oxygen and nutrients to my cells and that happens through movement mm-hmm yeah, it's, it's confusing because we're trying to get in sync with our body and listen to our body, which is part of this journey. But a big part of the message is our body is telling us some of the time, it's just don't move. <laughs> but I found I couldn't rest my way out of this. I couldn't just lay in bed or lay on the couch all day. I was never going to get better. I tried that for a long time and it didn't get me anywhere. I agree. I did the same thing. So it's great. There are so many things that did work for you. Were there some things that you tried that didn't work for you? And what were they? If so. I think the the thing that doesn't work is chasing symptoms. 
Um, so I was chasing pain for a long time, whether it was taking this pill, taking this supplement. Everyone always wants to know what supplements I'm on. And I'm going to be real honest, though, the supplements I take are based on my blood work and my genetic profile. They're not necessarily applicable to, to anyone else. So it doesn't yeah. be relevant. And, and I don't think supplements are the cure. So literally, the supplements I take are supporting a metabolic disease I have where my body doesn't produce enough. So I think this idea that there's going to be a quick fix, that there's a quick pill, just chasing sim- symptoms. I mean, you do need symptoms. And it's one of the best things I ever did go off of coffee. One of the best things you did was go off coffee? Yeah. Hormonally, it helped uh, rebalance my hormones. It healed my gut, and it also I, I have such good energy throughout the day. It just it was it was shooting up my cortisol too much and wrecking my hormones, just depleting my adrenals. So it made it it made a big impact. But for a while, I was like, "Ooh, quick fix! I like this." You know, <laughs> it seems like almost cruel advice for someone with chronic fatigue syndrome to say to stop having coffee. What do you mean? It's just it's the only thing that makes me feel better. But it makes you feel better, at least for me in the moment. But it put me on such a roller coaster. It messed up my blood sugar. It, yeah. In time, came to realize that a big part of my afternoon crashes was just the caffeine crash. And it's not a regular person caffeine crash. With CFS, it seems to be amplified. It's just yeah. it's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's a good point about the symptoms, too. I think we're all kind of brought up to chase symptoms. You know, we treat things one at a time. We look at our body like a car, you know, fix little parts individually. And I, I agree. I think it's a balance. You do have to treat some of them. You know, like for me, I wasn't sleeping and I did all the things under the sun that you're supposed to do and it just wasn't working. So for a while I had to take some, you know, pre- prescription sedatives and like you had, I had to target some symptoms individually, but in the end, what seems to pull its weight is looking at things in a more holistic viewpoint. I agree. And I, I, I had insomnia too, and I had to take medication and I'm not against that, but I, I'm talking about, yeah, overall healing. Yeah. Yeah. When people ask things like, you know, what, what supplement should I take for brain fog or what should I do for, you know, whatever pain in my body? And it's, it's really hard. I can't break any of it, most of it down. There wasn't specific things I did that worked for specific symptoms. It was just a slowly pulling my body out of all of it. So I actually get some people messaging me or commenting on videos that are wanting to get pregnant or thinking about having a child and then actually naturally brings up a lot of stuff for them. I don't have any children, so I, I don't have anything to offer on this, but I'm curious for you, what has this process been like, uh, this pregnancy with your history of illness? Well, if you had told me two years ago that I'd be pregnant, I would have thought that that's crazy. Like there's no <laughs> Like I, I was literally almost on my deathbed two years ago. I could never have imagined this future. I could have never imagined being well enough because I didn't want to be a burden, more of a burden to my husband. I didn't want the financial responsibility. I didn't think I could be a good mom. And I didn't want to, with that, um, watch that. So it was nothing I even thought about. And then when I, got better so quickly and I started to heal and heal from endometriosis, all these other things. I was like, well, I, I kind of, I had to have a good relationship with God. I prayed. I was like, well, what's the next step? What do you want from me? And I did feel I gave my life over. So I, I realized that was the one area I was holding back because I was still afraid. I didn't want to live in fear because it is fear because there's not a lot of research out there. Doctors couldn't make any promises to me. Uh, like, we think you'll be fine. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I'm scared. And two months are pregnant. And so that set me on a course of learning how to give up control in a whole nother way. And um, it, it has been quite a journey. I mean, I keep reminding myself these are normal symptoms. It does, it's triggering. It's triggering sometimes to be like, is this normal fatigue or is this, am I going back? Or, and, you know, are these headaches, are they going to turn into migraines again? You know, 
But I keep reminding myself, no, it's normal to have headaches when you're pregnant. It's normal to feel tired because you're growing a baby. Um, you know, and so I think in a way this experience is healing in itself because it's reminding me that um, I can feel and do that our body are more amazing than we think that they are. Uh, and so it's it's been definitely an interesting experience. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. It's something that I experience even not being pregnant. I imagine it's something we all experience to a certain extent. We're just a bit I don't want to say paranoid, but you know, we've been through a lot, so it's natural to question all these things and to get scared and have anxiety and is it coming back? Is this normal? I thought I was better. And it's, it's a constant reminder I have to have for myself that Getting better doesn't mean perfection. Nobody is. Nobody is perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, normal, healthy people get headaches. Healthy people have bad days. And so I try to draw that, that line uh, somewhere. But, you know, I did get gestational diabetes with this pregnancy. And I have to remind myself, well, two of my husband's coworkers have gesta had gestational like there, but it's so hard when we are so used to our own trauma from this experience to not think, oh no, like something. And probably go easy on ourselves for having those thoughts. It's it's natural. I think anyone's going to. And I would hope and I would imagine that as time passes, we'll get more and more comfortable with this and more used to just the regular ups and downs of life. This has clearly been a massive ordeal that you've been through. I always love knowing, you know, how this has changed you, how it's impacted your life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, total uh, different direction. I thought I was going to have this full-time career, um, occupational therapy, and how I saw my identity and how I valued myself was on my achievements. And that was taken away. And I had to realize that my value was deeper than that and that people love me, people want to help me. I had to learn to accept that. And I, it humbled me, changed me. I maybe was prideful before. Um, I wouldn't say I had a spirituality before, a relationship with God. And it took me getting so sick and so desperate and exhausted all my options. Or I was just willing to pray, like the simplest thing, which is free. You're spending thousands and thousands on all these treatments and all these things. And it, that changed me. Um, I could never be the person I was before. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. I appreciate life more. I don't know how quite how to put this, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a conflicted relationship, isn't it, with illness? Because I think it really does bring a lot of good and it really changes us and it really catapults our growth and puts us in a better direction, a lot of us anyways. So, you know, it's something that is so horrible and so horrendous and you wouldn't wish on anybody. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard to imagine your life, what it would be like if it hadn't gone that way. Yeah. It is really hard to describe what suffering does. I mean, this sometimes feels like I was in prison physically, and then I, I've been set free trying to teach me. I only get one life. I only get one life experience. And what is this life experience trying to teach me while I'm here? What can, how can I get the most out of Yeah, I think it is a perspective and an attitude, too. I mean, you can choose to take things away from it or not. It's happening either way. There's no taking it away. There's no choosing a life without it. So we can either use it to shape us into someone better than we were before or not. And it sounds like you've definitely, definitely gotten a lot out of this. So good for you for doing all of this work and coming out of this, you know, in such a good place. Thank you. It's, it's exciting to see that in other people. I love, I love that. I love hearing other people. Yeah, it really is. And and there really are so many people that are getting past these things. And I just, I don't think we see enough of it. It can be so discouraging to look online and see the prognosis for some of these illnesses. But there are so many people who are getting better at various stages of recovery. There's so much reason to be hopeful. And, and I love that there's more and more stories like yours coming out. And thank you so much for sharing yours because it just, it makes a world of difference. You know, I remember when I first got sick, I was trying to find recovery stories and I just couldn't find any, you know, this was 
I don't know, 12 year, years ago or something. I didn't hear of anyone getting better until I had gotten better. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. And then people, other people start reaching out to me. It's crazy. We're just so shocked. Like, hey, yeah. so nice to meet you. You recovered as well. This is incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it's just really nice. It's really nice to see. So if you could go back in time to when this first all happened, I'm curious what you would tell yourself. What would you have wanted to know at the beginning that you think could have helped you navigate this or at least been better prepared for what, what was to come? I guess what we just said, I think uh, that there are other people out there that have gotten better. If I own that in the beginning, I don't know, my motivation... I mean, I was pretty motivated, but man, just knowing that would have just, I was so defeated from day one when the doctor told me, your life is over. And when I was first diagnosed with fibromyalgia and they said, this is it, your life is over, this is forever. And I was, I didn't want to believe that. I, I Part of me rejected it, but you can't unhear it. Yeah. So it messed with my mind. And if I had known, no, that's not true. You can't limit a person's potential. You don't know everything about chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. So how can you possibly have the answers? And for me now in my faith, it's like you cannot limit a limitless God. So I guess I would just tell myself to trust that process because I think I did have to go through all those years of research and learning, I couldn't just skip ahead to, to know what I know now. I mean, that took year, that took years. It was like going to getting a bachelor's degree in chronic illness. So I don't know if there's a quick, quick way through that uh, of learning your body and learning what works specifically for you. Um, but I guess I would just tell myself that it is very, very possible. That is so perfectly put. I've never heard that before, like getting a bachelor's degree in chronic illness. That is pretty much what all of us have to do. I worked way harder at this recovery than at any of my actual degrees. You know, you had to learn so much. I think that is the most important point about the hope and not just hope, but knowledge that people do get past it because it's, it's the, really the biggest part of the fuel because this is such a marathon. It really is. It's really hard. It's exhausting it's a lot of work it's you know it's, it's boring it's lonely it's stressful it's depressing and if you don't even know that it's actually possible i think most of us hold on to this deep hope within us like i will get past this i am determined but when you don't even know if it's possible in those really bad days or weeks or months it's really hard to keep picking yourself back up important important for to know watching people do get better we don't know, you know what everyone's prognosis is and we don't know what everyone's journey is going to be. So you obviously can't say for certain what's going to happen for everybody. But uh, I think exactly as you said, we cannot put limits on it. No one can put limits on your recovery. Uh, thank you so much, Katie, for sharing your story today. I, it really is incredibly moving. You know, I've had goosebumps. You've brought me to tears. It's just really wonderful how far you've come and it's so amazing to see you living this amazing life and happy and thriving and about to have your baby very soon uh, so just thank you so much for sharing this with us today thank you for asking me to do it it's my pleasure i love it i i love what you're doing i i'm so happy i got to meet liz and i've gotten to meet oh my goodness so many people it's i literally when i think about like us being in a room i probably would just cry yeah, and like I would just high five people and hug people and cry and be like we survived, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> How amazing would that be? <laughs> I just, just it's just so. I think about somebody. I can picture somebody in their bed. Just, I mean, this would have been mind blowing to me to have. I would have been like, what? And it's funny, I don't I don't know if you get these types of messages too, but people will be like, how do you know you really had chronic fatigue? They can't wrap their head around this. Someone could feel because they've been told so many times. Yeah. And I'm like, that's why the more pictures we can show them of people, so it's not just me saying it. There's yeah. 
a whole group of people stepping forward that it's like undeniable evidence. Yeah, I, I definitely get that too. You know, it comments or people sort of like, oh, I'm not sure you ever really had it or you probably clearly you weren't all that sick or right. that doesn't actually work for chronic fatigue syndrome because no one can get better from that. Or it just, right. it, and, and most people aren't like that. Most people, you know, are, it, there's mm -hmm. a lot of positivity out there, but you can understand the people who are jaded, who are skeptical and it just, they just can't wrap their head around it. Like, no, this can't be, you're not like me. We're not the same. That's not possible. I don't know what's I, happening there, yeah. but that's not it. So I try not to be like defensive. I'm like, whatever. I know my life. Like, I don't have anything to prove. That's such a good attitude to have. And that's such a good way to look at it. Because I find it is easy to get defensive because sometimes it can feel like an attack and feel like you have to defend your illness, which is not helping anything or anyone. Uh, if, if people want to find you, if they want to ask you questions or know more, know more about you, where can they find you? I'm on Instagram. Uh, my handle is healing faithfully one word and i have a site where i share more details about my story and healing aspects and it's called healingfaithfully.com and i do have a Facebook page too called healing faithfully so that would be the best way and my email is actually on instagram so somebody who wanted to tell me Great. And I'll have all of this listed in the video description. So if anyone wants to take a look and find exactly the details, it will all be there. All right. And for those of you watching, as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions for Katie, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them. Uh, so yeah, so please leave your thoughts, leave your comments below. We'd really love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this video, if you think it's helpful, if you think it had value, please share it. You can share it on Facebook. There are share links below the video that you can do it directly, or you can just copy the link and share it yourself, or you can take a screenshot and share it on Instagram. Let's get these stories out there. Let's keep the hope and inspiration uh, going and help one another out because there are far, far too many people who are still suffering right now that I'm sure could use a little inspiration sent their way. So if we're not already friends on Instagram, please come find Katie, come find myself. We'd love to hear from you and you can see a little bit more about us and our lives and a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff that's going on. And thank you to all of you who are watching. Thank you for your support. Thank you for commenting and liking and subscribing and all of that. We really do appreciate it. And there are more videos and more interviews coming up with more MECFS stories. So if you haven't already subscribed, make sure to do so because you're not going to want to miss those. So thank you again to Katie. Thank you to all of you watching. And that is it for today. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye.